Well, good afternoon, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I think some more participants will join us, but since we are very limited in time, we only have 50, min 50 minutes, uh, let us start. Uh, my name is Drago Kos. I have the privilege and an honor to, to chair the OECD Working Group on Bribery. And today we will discuss, let's say, our main feature, which is, let's say, the enforcement. As you probably know, we have been established in 94. Today we have 44 member states. We are monitoring what, how our member states are uh, enforcing the OECD Anti-Bribery Convention. And of course, we put a lot of emphasis on the legislation which is needed uh, to fight foreign bribery on the institutions. Uh, we want them to be autonomous in doing their, their uh, job. We want them to be adequately resourced. But what is the most important thing is the enforcement. And uh, I hope you you took a look. You have you taken a look on what we wrote for the Angas website. Uh, the title of the presentation was very simple: enforcement is the key. And this will also be the let's say the main idea of today's presentations. Uh, we will have we have selected well we have invited speakers from all our continents at a different level of uh, let's say development of. Uh, legislation, institutional setup, and practical setup. Just to show you all that uh, the Working Group on Bribery is uh, accepting and, uh, let's say, enforcing, enhancing the work of many very different countries with very different legal background, but all sharing one aim. And this is enforcing the anti -bribery, OECD Anti-Bribery Convention leveling the playing field for all companies of our member states and to fight corruption. Uh, due to the, as I said, very limited amount of time, each of our speakers will be speak for six minutes maximum. Uh, those of you who would like to ask some questions, feel free to do it. You can do it right now already in the chat box and uh, I will go through the questions and then I will select the most interesting ones because at the end we will only have 15 minutes for questions. So if you want to ask any of the speakers anything, write a question down in the chat box and uh, I will take care that you will get the proper response. So we will first go to Africa, namely or to the country South Africa. Mr. Lebo Baloy will be with us, advocate and special director of public prosecutions, specialized commercial crime unit. He's new at this position, so I would like to congratulate you for this position. And very simple question, how did South Africa come to the idea to join the WGB uh, to the convention and how, if in any way, the participation in the working group on bribery has, let's say, enhanced your anti-corruption and anti-bribery efforts. So Mr. Bloy, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Mr. Program Director. Um, as a form of introduction, I wish to mention that South Africa's experience upon acceding to the OECD Convention has been a very positive one, whereupon the country has reaped the following benefits. In view of the fact that the OECD is a body with the goal to stimulate economic development, their recognition of South Africa's efforts to combat the scourge of corruption boosts investor confidence and supports inward investment flows to South Africa. The direct benefit of this coordinated work in the corruption field are on creating awareness and the strengthening of policies and frameworks. In this regard, a thorough review and analysis of the capacity in the prosecuting and investigating environments was done, whereupon recommendations were adopted to address the situation. Various policy sessions were conducted, not only to provide feedback and clarity on the working group processes, such as the phase four assessment tool, but also to improve the mutual legal assistance regime. In this regard, the Department of Justice, being South Africa's central authority, the South African Police Service, as well as the National Prosecuting Authority, share important information on mutual legal assistance requests with the view to detecting possible foreign bribery cases for investigation. The coordination is also aimed at ensuring that incoming requests for assistance relating to the foreign bribery offense are attended to as speedily as possible. In addition, the OECD policy discussions around foreign bribery were used 
to review South Africa's legislative framework, in particular, our Corruption Legislation, the Prevention and Combating of Corrupt Activities Act of 2004. Such discussions were also used to streamline South Africa's financial reporting systems with the view to addressing money laundering and the detection of foreign bribery. The lack of coordination between various stakeholders who are involved in the fight against the scourge of foreign bribery was also addressed. As a result, all foreign bribery cases are currently overseen by the anti-corruption task team, which is a task team made up of various stakeholders involved in the fight against corruption. It should be noted that South Africa's domestic legislation and our institutional framework were thoroughly assessed through our phase one to three assessments and were found by the working group to be sufficient. Further, the working group's recommendations contributed to the review of South Africa's prosecution and investigation policies, aligning them to international standards and ensuring that these were independent from Article 5 considerations, which are the political and economic interference. Sentences for corruption, including foreign bribery, were also addressed by amending existing legislation to make provision for stricter sentences. Communication on the notion of foreign bribery has also increased. Thus, a pamphlet used within the justice cluster to address foreign bribery was developed. In addition, training material was developed for prosecutors and members of the South African Police Service with a view to enhancing the investigation and the prosecution skill of foreign bribery cases. Awareness of the foreign bribery offense within the private sector was also raised. South Africa's global role is supported as other BRICS countries also form part of the working group with the exception of China and India. In addition, South Africa's engagement with the working group also addresses the goals of our national development plan in South Africa. In terms of chapter 12 of the plan, in 2030, people living in South Africa should feel safe and have no fear of crime. This is to be achieved through strengthening the criminal justice system and an integrated approach to safety and security, which requires coordination across a variety of government departments and all stakeholders. In terms of chapter 14 of the plan, in 2030, South Africa will have zero tolerance to corruption, whereby its empowered citizenry will have the confidence and the knowledge to hold public and private officials to account, and its leaders will hold themselves to high ethical standards and act with integrity. This South Africa has a resilient anti-corruption system in which anti-corruption agencies have the resources, credibility, and powers to investigate corruption and their investigations are acted upon. Finally, Mr. Program Director, South Africa having acceded to the OECD convention is afforded the benefit to participate and to engage with other member countries in the working groups law enforcement officials meetings, as well as the global network of law enforcement practitioners. Best practices regarding the investigation and prosecution of corruption cases are shared in these platforms. In addition, the working group undertakes tactical missions to member countries, which countries benefit and learn from experiences and best practices which are being shared. That will be my input, Mr. Program Director. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you very much, Madam Baloy, and do apologize for calling you Mr. You know, I, I am very bad with, with your name, so but I, I will remember your name now. I will not commit to the same mistake once again. Thank you. It's not, it was... a, it's not a problem, Mr. Program Director. Thank you. Thank you. So the next one is Mr. Yin He Lee. He's the prosecutor from the Ministry of Justice Korea. And Mr. He Lee, so Korea went through some rough times uh, in the past years, uh, but it, it we say I'm speaking about corruption cases involving your top officials, but it came back very quick. You, you're back at the same level or even better than you were before. So did your participation in the working pro bribery or let's say any uh, had any influence on your say the resilience you have proven in dealing with those cases? So Mr. Hinley, it is your turn. Thank you for your my uh, this opportunity. 
And hello, I'm Jin Hee Lee, National Prosecutor of Korea. Now I'm in the International Criminal Affairs Division of the Ministry of Justice. And I'm going to introduce of Korea's experience with the WGB evaluation process. On December 17, 1997, OECD signed the Anti-Bribery Convention in order to prevent corruption and establish a level playing field by criminalizing bribes paid to foreign public officers. In accordance with the standards set forth by the convention, secretaries must take legislative actions required to hold bribes paid to foreign officers criminally liable. They are also obligated to cooperate with other states for mutual legal assistance and criminal extradition. Over the course of four different phases since 1999, while expecting the process made, the WGB has employed the mutual evaluation process to have member states check each other's legislative action to implementation of the convention, law enforcement made against foreign bribery cases, and upgrading the counting system, etc. Following the evaluation, the WGB provides recommendations for identified rooms for improvement and continuously checks on improvement or implementations made in one or two year intervals. The Republic of Korea joined the convention in 1997 and enacted the act on combating bribery of foreign public officers in International Business Transaction, FBPA, in 1999 to implement the convention. During phase four in 2018, Korea was evaluating on whether substantial measures have been taken to detect and enforce foreign bribery cases as well as to hold legal persons criminally liable. The OECD recommended that actively detect and mitigate foreign bribery allegations and improve the judicial practice of the sentences and punishments in bribery cases. In 2018, Korea detected a case where a Korean Broker in order to provide a foreign public officer with a bribe. At that time, however, the FBA, PPA did not have any provision for punishing an act of transferring a bribe to a third party with intent to give a bribe to a foreign public officer. So, in December 2018, Korea nearly established a provision for punishing those who pay bribes to a third party with the intent to deliver it to a foreign public officer or those who receive the bribes with the knowledge thereof, thereby removing a loophole in punishment. Korea has continuously implemented the recommendations from page four evaluation in 2018. In particular, the Protection of Communication Secrets Act was amended to allow wiretapping in foreign bribery cases in December 2019, thereby implementing recommendations to extend the availability of wiretapping to foreign bribery investigations so as to detect foreign bribery acts secretly conducted. The FBPA was also amended to drastically increase the fines imposed in February 2020, thereby implementing the recommendation to increase the statutory punishment impossible to natural and legal persons. In addition, the Ministry of Justice publishes interpretive notes on the FBPA about the convention and recommendations of the WGB and distributed to the prosecutor's offices, the police, courts, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, and other relevant agencies to have the investigative authorities and the courts to better understand the convention and strengthen their capability of countering foreign bribery cases. To better detect foreign bribery cases, the Ministry of Justice has tasked personnel eligible to practice the law to monitor foreign media and press releases of other countries. 
and the Supreme Prosecutor's Office also verify media coverages and collect crime information through its investigatory information office. Moreover, after receiving an insider report on employees of a Korean company giving bribes to an African tax officer to evade taxes, the prosecution sent MLA requests twice and conducted account tracking, search and seizure, etc. As a result of investigation spanning over three years, the prosecution manages to obtain confessions from the suspects and indict five natural persons. As such, the prosecutor's office is actively utilizing the MLA and extradition framework when investigating foreign bribery cases. Thank you for listening. So thank you very much. Uh, that was very useful uh, presentation. Uh, and we now we are now moving to the third continent. It's Latin America, and we will speak with Mr. Luis Miguel Martinez. He specializes in economic criminal law and former director of against money laundering at Prosecutor General's Office, Colombia. We, Mr. Martinez, we we learned in the last years, let's say that um, many of Latin American countries have had maybe some some still have big problems with introduction of uh, legislation on liability, on liability of legal persons and uh, the working group on bribery and the oc commission itself have played a major role here so what can you tell us how the convention and the wgb have influenced your work in this area and but also in general terms was is there any let's say consequence of the fact that we are pushing countries so hard for the enforcement of the convention. Mr. Martinez. Mr. Martinez, if you're with us, we cannot hear you. Mr. Martinez. Well, it looks we have some problems with Mr. Martinez. Uh, hopefully this will be settled. Uh, meanwhile, we can go to the next speaker, which is Mr. Sean Byrne. He's the interim chief investigator from the Serious Fraud Office, United Kingdom. Mr. Byrne, you know, after a very, let's say, interesting years, let's call them politely interesting years, which were there in the relation between the uh, working group on bribery in the United Kingdom, after adoption of 2010 uh, UK Bribery Act, uh, the cooperation is improving. And what we see is, let's say, the, the serious fraud, fraud office has gained new wind in the sails in fighting foreign bribery. There were some attempts, let's say, which were uh, against the SFO, you have survived that. So can you tell us how a country like United Kingdom and let's say in institutions like the SFO uh, feels about participation in the working group of bribery? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, the SFO is, is unique amongst UK criminal law enforcement agencies. It both investigates and prosecutes its own cases. Um, we're independent of government and uh, we're superintended, but not directed by the Attorney General, an elected politician. And this is this operational independence is clearly uh, very important. Uh, we work alongside other domestic law enforcement agencies across the economic crime landscape, uh, and we're a key stakeholder in the National Economic Crime Centre hosted by the UK National Crime Agency. Internationally, the SFO is part of a network of law enforcement agencies working together in order to pursue criminal wrongdoing across global jurisdictions. And there are some excellent examples of success when this global community assists one another. The UK is currently undergoing a follow-up to our OECD phase four review, which was conducted in 2017. We received a positive evaluation from the working group examiners who issued a number of recommendations and the UK and the SFO welcome these recommendations. These reviews enable us to continuously improve our own anti-bribery systems and encourage partner countries to raise their standards too. The UK is one of the major enforcers among the working group countries. 
A Bribery Act 2010, which came in force in 2011, as you mentioned, Mr. Chairman, is considered an international gold standard in anti-bribery and corruption legislation. Section seven of the UK Bribery Act took a new approach to corporate criminal liability. It made legal persons criminally liable for failing to prevent bribery, subject to a compliance defense of having adequate anti-bribery procedures in place, with no need to prove involvement or intent by the legal person's direct in mind. This incentivized legal persons to put in place an appropriate compliance program and made it easier to prosecute them for bribery and corruption where they failed to do so. And since 24th of February, 2014, designated prosecutors, including the director of the SFO, can invite legal persons to negotiate a non-trial resolution known in the UK as the Deferred Prosecution Agreement as an alternative to facing prosecution. Non-trial resolutions are available for economic crimes only, including corruption offences, and can be used in respect of criminal conduct that predates the legislation. The Bribery Act has underpinned some of our high profile non-trial resolutions, such as with Airbus SE on the 31st of January 2020, in which Airbus agreed to a financial penalty in the UK of just under 984 million euros, plus the SFO's cost of nearly 7 million euros. This was part of a global settlement of 3.6 billion euros, with Airbus agreeing to payments of just over 2 billion euros to the French PNF, and just over 525 million euros to US authorities for separate bribery offences which were covered by their respective jurisdictions. There are other notable successes. In January this year, the former global head of sales at Petrofac pleaded guilty to his role in offering and making corrupt payments to agents to influence the award of an engineering procurement and construction contract worth approximately $3.3 billion. In February this year, the former senior sales manager of SBM Offshore was convicted of conspiracy to give corrupt payments in relation to a $1.7 billion contract and was sentenced to three and a half years imprisonment. And in April this year, GPT Special Project Management Limited pleaded guilty to corruption in relation to contracts awarded to it and has paid confiscation fine and costs totaling over 30 million pounds. In many of the cases where I've laid charges, there are aspects of the case that would not have progressed without strong international cooperation and partnership. The SFO has developed strong relationships, both at strategic and operational level, and engagement in multilateral international forums, such as the OECD Working Group on Bribery and the Working Group on Bribery's biannual informal meeting of law enforcement officials, focusing on practical challenges, joint working and sharing best practice have been key to building those relationships. Pre-pandemic, the SFO also regularly delivered training on bribery issues on behalf of the UK government. The OECD and UN Convention Against Corruption, and I expect us to continue to do that going forward. This work helps us to both spread good practice and develop closer working relationships with overseas investigators and prosecutors. But despite these excellent tools and strong international relationships, there is more the UK can do to increase effectiveness and enforcement of foreign bribery. While the UK is made up of four countries, there are three legal jurisdictions. England and Wales is one jurisdiction, Scotland and Northern Ireland are each a jurisdiction. The criminal legal system that operates in England and Wales has remained entirely separate from that of Scotland and Northern Ireland, and they are considered as separate jurisdictions. Even within England and Wales, the SFO is not the only law enforcement agency with a remit to investigate foreign bribery. For example, the National Crime Agency has an international corruption unit, and although the Bribery Act 2010 applies to all three UK jurisdictions, the Crime and Courts Act, which permits non-trial resolutions, does not. The examiners noted that frameworks for foreign bribery enforcement in other UK jurisdictions could be brought in line with those in place in England and Wales, and there was scope to improve communication between law enforcement authorities from England and Wales and those in Scotland. The UK's Working Group on Bribery Examiners made a number of recommendations regarding UK interagency cooperation in foreign bribery cases. I won't go through them. Recommendations made by the Working Group on Bribery have helped increase political awareness of tackling foreign bribery, has driven activity in the UK and provided a basis for discussions with enforcement partners. We have now, following our phase four review, introduced improved mechanisms for information sharing and coordination. We have a memorandum of understanding between all the relevant authorities, which states each authority's remit and interest. It sets out the mechanisms for coordination, which include regular meetings of a clearinghouse for deconfliction, where we also consider new allegations added to the working group on bribery's matrix of foreign bribery allegations. The SFO is working with the UK's tax authority to increase detection of international bribery and corruption in the work of their staff. Hopefully from this, you can see the benefits of international cooperation and having that critical friend review and evaluation, which highlights areas for continuous improvement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, Mr. Burns. So I hope, let's say now the participants have heard 
let's say that even in the jurisdictions like the one from the UK, which is able to go after, let's say, the flagships like like uh, Airbus, uh, there are still some topics to to be dealt with, uh, and the working group is pinpointing on those on those uh, topics. I can just say, let's say, in the last phase four report, the United Kingdom received forty four recommendations. Of course, those were very specified, very focused recommendations, all with the aim to to make the already good UK system even better. And uh, UK is doing this in a very good way. And the last case, the GPT case, which was also mentioned, has also proven that, let's say that uh, the serious road office is able and capable, and not only the SFO, but also let's say this, the whole UK judicial system is, uh, law enforcement the judicial system is able to cope with, let's say with the criminal offense or foreign bribery, even if the, let's say, the global trademarks are involved. And this is what we want. This is what we ask from our countries. Next country, the United States, uh, it is, let's say, it is one of our best, if not the best enforcer of the convention. We have today Mr. Daniel Kahn with us. He's the acting chief of road session of the Department of Justice. So Mr. Kahn, how, how does it work for the United States? No, let's see, being at the peak of, or let's say, the, in the leading position of the uh, anti bribery efforts in the world, international bribery, of course, uh, and uh, let's say, still working with the working group. Are there any benefits for you? And if yes, which ones? Well, thank, thank you very much, Chair. I, I appreciate it. And it's, it's certainly an honor to be here. Uh, and I will say it's particularly an honor that, that you chose me to speak over Charles Kane. So that, that's always uh, a big, a big uh, rivalry between us. So I'll make sure that I lord this over him for a very long time. Um, but there, there are certainly uh, a number of, of benefits. I, I think we are extraordinarily grateful for, for all of the great work uh, of the OECD. Um, and I think that the benefits to, to the United States are, are similar to those of, of all the other uh, countries and continents that we heard from. Um, I, I think there are really, from, from my perspective, um, five distinct benefits, and, and I think they're related, but um, I'll, I'll just walk through them. Um, you know, the first is uh, that foreign bribery is, is not something that any one country uh, is is able to tackle. Um, frankly, it's not something that that even uh, a a small number of countries are are able to handle. Given um, the fact that this is uh, a transnational crime, um, and given the fact that there are incentives created for companies to pay bribes if uh, their competitors are paying bribes, we need to make sure that both the supply side. Um, and the demand side are being addressed uh, across the board and not just by a small group of, of countries. And so I think what the OECD and the working group on bribery has, has set out to achieve um, is, is, is hugely uh, important. Um, I, I think that the second benefit is that it allowed us to, to strengthen the FCPA. Uh, I, I think as with all the other countries, we have to sign on to certain requirements um, we amended the FCPA in, in 1998, our, our foreign bribery law. Um, and although it had been uh, in, enacted since, um, you know, for, for about two decades before that, uh, and, and was the first law of its kind, I think we always recognize that there are ways to strengthen laws and, and make them better. And, and that's what we did in 1998. Um, we added a territorial provision. Uh, we added a, an alternative jurisdiction and a nationality. Um, jurisdiction provision. Uh, and so that is, is I think, a, a second um, very important benefit. Um, the third, and, and I know that a, a number of the speakers and presenters have already touched on this, is um, the OECD and the Working Group on Bribery allows us to, to learn from others, um, to strengthen our enforcement. Uh, you know, during my tenure uh, at the Department of Justice and in the FCPA unit um, and at the fraud section, we've had our, our phase three and phase four review. I think those were extraordinarily helpful in identifying uh, areas where we could further enhance what we're doing um, in, in our enforcement regime. Uh, and so I think we are certainly grateful for that. And, and we learn from our colleagues. Uh, we learn from our international colleagues and, and best practices and, 
Um, I think that is a huge benefit that, that we are all able to learn from one another uh, and um, draw upon the lessons learned from, from various uh, experiences that, that we all have. Um, and I think that the last two, uh, from, from my perspective, are, are the biggest impact on, on the day to day, which is cooperation and coordination. Uh, as I mentioned, with, with foreign bribery, uh, we, we can't possibly um, gather all of the, the evidence to make out a case simply uh, within one country. Um, maybe there are, are some rare cases where that is possible, uh, but oftentimes we're talking about um, one country where a company is based, um, there's a subsidiary in a second country, there is a third party intermediary in a third country, uh, there are bank accounts being used in fourth, fifth, and sixth countries, and foreign officials being bribed um, in, in yet another country. And so in order to put the pieces together, in order to trace the money, in order to figure out exactly what happened, we need cooperation from, from our counterparts. And I think one of the, the biggest benefits of the, the OECD and the Working Group on Bribery is it provides a platform for all of us to talk to one another, to get to know one another, to be able to rely on one another for cooperation. Um, and where, whereas the, the mutual legal assistance treaty process is, is certainly uh, critical, and, and I think it is um, a, a wonderful tool, it also can take time um, and it, it can sometimes get lost in bureaucracy. And I think the, the working group on bribery allowing us to get to know one another uh, enables us to make sure that that doesn't happen. Um, I think we are able to uh, direct uh, an MLAT request to a particular prosecutor or prosecution office. Um, it allows us to call over and try to get evidence and, and information informally and, and informal cooperation. Um, and that is what, in my mind, has made us um, so successful in prosecuting foreign bribery over, over the past uh, decade in particular. I think the, the level of cooperation, um, the, the number of countries that are engaged um, is, is a, a you know, direct result from the great work of the Working Group on Bribery and, and our enforcement efforts um, flow uh, from that and, and from the significant cooperation we've received from, from our foreign counterparts. Um, and then the final point I'll just touch on briefly, and, and again, I know that uh, the UK mentioned this and, and you know, I, I second everything that was said there in terms of coordination and, and working together to achieve coordinated resolutions. Um, I think there are two important benefits to achieving coordinated resolutions where we are working together to make sure that there is one penalty imposed on a company as opposed to many different pile-on resolutions um, that may impose duplicative penalties for the same conduct. I think number one is that it's fair. Uh, if, if there is a penalty that is the appropriate penalty to punish the behavior and to deter bad behavior, um, that, that penalty should be driven by what is the appropriate penalty, not by the number of countries that are involved in the resolution. Um, and so by us working together, uh, we have been able to make sure that we are, are imposing the appropriate penalty as opposed to um, just doubling it every time a new, a new country gets involved in the case. Um, and I also think because of that, and because we're, we're treating companies fairly, there is a, a corollary benefit to us as enforcers because it encourages good corporate behavior. If a company knows that they're gonna be treated fairly, they are more likely to bring misconduct to our attention. They're more likely to cooperate with our ongoing investigation. Um, and so uh, as because of that, um, we, we have in the United States imposed a, an internal policy within the Department of Justice um, that encourages, uh, and, and encourages prosecutors to um, coordinate with foreign authorities as well as domestic authorities to, avo to avoid duplicative, uh, to avoid imposing duplicative penalties. Um, and, you know, at least in the, in the past, um, you know, five to six or seven years that I have been um, running the FCPA unit or, or overseeing the fraud section, um, we have coordinated with a number of our partners um, from the, the working group on bribery, uh, including Brazil, the Netherlands, the UK, France, Switzerland, Sweden, Germany. Um, and we have been working with others and expect that we will uh, very soon be 
um, coordinating with, with others as well, um, including uh, a number of the countries who have spoken today. So we're always looking forward to, to working with other members. Um, we're always looking forward to coordinating, coordinating resolutions uh, with other members. Um, but those, in, in my mind, are, are critical and essential components of, of why the OECD and the Working Group on Bribery uh, has been incredibly helpful and important for the United States. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Khan. As you said, you know, effective international cooperation is one of our let's say, most important goals. And we are really, really doing anything possible to make it even more effective because this is what our law enforcement agencies deserve. This is what our judiciary is deserve, but also this is what our suspects, either natural or legal persons deserve. This time, I hope we will have luck with, with Colombia. Mr. Luis Miguel Martinez, I saw you online, so I'm sure you, you are with us now. That's right. Go on. Okay, uh, thank you for having me. Um, I uh, want to jump into the subject right away. Uh, and basically what I understood from your question was uh, what was Colombia doing regarding, you know, uh, liability of legal persons and how uh, being a part of the, of the working group has helped us, you know, to thrive through the uh, common issues that uh, uh, arise from uh, prosecuting and, and trying to investigate legal persons when involved in foreign bribery cases. First of all, I want to start by saying that, uh, as we all know, uh, the convention doesn't require a particular type of liability of legal persons for each legal systems, but uh, it encourages basically, you know, uh, having sanctions uh, and proportionate and dissuasive sanctions when a legal person is involved in, in foreign bribery cases. Based uh, upon that baseline, uh, Colombia decided to have a mixed system, even though we don't have, you know, uh, criminal liability of legal persons. In criminal procedure, we can request the judge to debar a legal person, not only, you know, as a final uh, sanction uh, at the end of the process, but also as a precautionary measure. Uh, we just have to demonstrate that they are involved in foreign bribery cases. We also have, you know, um, different uh, type of uh, responsibility, which is administrative and is um, uh, in charge of uh, superintendents of corporations. Basically, the sanctions are, uh, you know, monetary sanctions up to 200,000 uh, minimum Colombian wages, which would be more or less like near 5 million US dollars. Also, departments up to 20 years. Uh, you know, the publication of the sanction in widespread media and also the prohibition to receive any benefit or subsidy from the government up to five years. So with this mixed uh, legal system, um, we ha have encountered, you know, some pros and cons uh, of having uh, this type of, of investigations. We feel that the pros uh, are bigger than the cons, but the cons, you can say that well, we have two different possibilities executed by two different uh, entities which belong to two different branches. Uh, both of them are, you know, bound by due process, but criminal uh, process, you know, is, uh, ha has higher burdens and some of, invest of the criminal investigation activities have to be approved before or after by guaranteed judges. So uh, we know that most of the legal systems have principles that uh, allow different branches of power to cooperate to pursue uh, common state goals. So based upon these uh, um, faculties, we sign a, a protocol with the superintendents of corporation basically to try to, uh, you know, to come up uh, with the capabilities and, and, and the powers that the other didn't have. Uh, this uh, protocol was signed uh, in, on, two times, on 2019, and uh, it basically states by monthly meetings, you know, to uh, follow up and report progress on ongoing cases. It also stated that any investigation uh, opened by any of these uh, entities, the Prosecutor General's Office or the Superintendents of Corporations, must be opened right away in the other entity. 
and also analysis, evidence, and reports may be shared if the secrecy of the investigation allowed it. And also we have, you know, some common uh, issues regarding training. This obviously um, wouldn't, ha I mean, wouldn't have been possible without, you know, the, the participation of Colombia and the help of the working group. As um, everybody said before me, uh, belonging to the um, uh, working group allows you to, to, to share the experience uh, not only of member countries, but also from invited countries. And uh, in those discussions, it, it really helped us to, to uh, make clear what was the best option for Colombia. I have to say also that uh, by the time I left the prosecutor general office, which was November of 2020, we had uh, already a rule case by the superintendents of corporations regarding a foreign bribery case with a fine up to more or less $1.3 million uh, at this time. And also we had uh, six ongoing cases which were, you know, really uh, parallel in both entities. Uh, the progress was really good at both entities. Uh, sadly, those uh, cases, as I remember, were with non, uh, with uh, third countries, non party to the conventions. But, uh, you know, sharing enough information has allowed us to, to improve our investigation. Also, uh, I want to say that, you know, being in the group and the possibility to construct concepts and formulate legal dispositions, domestic legal dispositions and regulations based upon the experience, not only of seasoned countries, you know, as the US or UK, but also novice uh, countries, allowed us to model some scenarios, different scenarios, which we feel resulted in better solutions for Colombian system to detect and to investigate uh, foreign bribery cases. Finally, I want to say um, that, as we probably know, we'll probably know this is an unfinished work, and that we at Colombia strongly believe that every meeting of the working group and every discussion on the scope or modification of the conventions, uh, you know, the the the, the meetings uh, of the group uh, just for enforcement authorities um, is really an opportunity not only to set and improve the minimum standards we already have, but to evolve and to improve, you know, global tools and capacities to combat, you know, not only foreign bribery, but also domestic cor corruption in each of our countries. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Martinez. So this was a very good example of, let's say, how the convention and the working group helped the country to, let's say, to, to build a system which did not exist before, the, the system of liability persons. So we, we have three minutes and a half until the end. We have uh, four questions. The first two questions are basically directed to the working group bribery, so we'll try to respond to them. The first question was why the OECD is not publishing annual enforcement data. We are publishing annually enforcement data, but they do not refer to, let's say, to, to the annual enforcement, simply because some of our member states have huge difficulties to collect this data, especially I'm talking about federal states. So what we published what we what we have, uh, and uh, you know, in federal states, it is extremely difficult to change the rules of other federal entities to be able to collect the data. And this is the only reason. If we would have them, we would publish them. Next one is what is the WGB position on the draft and the corruption protocol to the UNCAC, and if you would support international anti corruption courts. And then, of course, uh, how did we deal with Article 18 of the UN Convention? And if you're looking forward to establish something similar to 10 principles of anti corruption, I have to say that you know, the OECD is strictly focused on the mandate, and the mandate, the mandate is monitoring the enforcement of the convention, which is very narrow in scope. So we don't deal with trading in influence because only we only deal for the moment with active bribery of foreign public officials. And uh, we normally we do not take positions on general anti-corruption initiatives which are happening, but we uh, in, engage our countries in doing so. We try to motivate them to join those initiatives if they think they are useful, if they think they, they will enhance the level of enforcement. And I, this should not be forgotten. Right now, we are developed, we are reviewing the document, which was called, it is called 2009 Recommendation for Furthering 
uh, committing foreign bribery. And in this document, we will encompass some of the principles which, which have just been mentioned too. And I have to say that it is not only WGB and the OECD which is developing uh, legal standards important for the fight against corruption. There are other, let's say, parts of the OECD too. And the last one was concerning the ethics and fight against corruption in state-owned enterprises. Uh, there, was a, there was a question for Mr. Byrne from, uh, uh, concerning the 2010 UK Bribery Act. Basically, in essence, what is missing in the UK Bribery Act to, to enable SFO to exercise its power more efficiently? Mr. Byrne, can I ask you for a very brief response because we only have one minute left. Uh, yeah, it'd be very quick. There's nothing that um, immediately springs to mind. What was really important in the act, I think, was to have the uh, the failure to prevent bribery and corruption and the corporate criminal liability, and that's covered in the act. So in order to change things, I would say there's nothing immediately springs to mind. And what would be really useful, though not part of this discussion, is to have similar kind of provisions in fraud in general, kind of fraud legislation, I think. Uh, but there's nothing that immediately springs to mind, I would say, was missing that um, should have been included. Thank you. And I know that, let's say, the UK is uh, on a regular basis is assessing and reviewing the effectiveness of the Barber Act. So I don't, I don't remember many countries doing so. So this is also another guarantee that, uh, let's say, that the UK Barber Act will be kept uh, up to date all the time. Then we got a question from, uh, it was the Peace and Justice Alliance from Canada on uh, the problem of kleptocratic uh, perpetrators hiding their assets, hiding their stolen assets in the Western democracies. I have to say we are dealing with this question a lot, but not on a general, in the general terms, of course. We only deal with those issues through concrete cases. So, and uh, of course, we do understand that those cases are very important for the countries where the, the assets have been stolen from. And that's why we are and that, when I say we, this, this means all countries in the group are really working hard uh, to establish effective international cooperation and to ensure that, let's say, the, the uh, stolen assets are being foreseized and then confiscated. But of course, there is, it is extremely important uh, uh, that we also have cooperation from the country where the assets are coming from, because uh, one country, one sided approach can do much here. But you can rest assured that our countries will do everything in their power to uh, not only to punish the perpetrators, but also to return the assets back to the countries where they have been stolen from. Then we have, uh, I don't know if this is Mr. Mr. I think it's Mrs. Prado. Uh, you, your hand is up. Uh, we do not see your question, but since, let's say, I give you one minute to ask the question. Uh, which you have. And please tell us whom we would you like to ask the question. Ms. Prado. Nothing. Okay, so let me thank you all for participation, special of course to our speakers. Uh, I think we gave quite a, let's say, a truthful presentation of our work, uh, you know, Really, for us, enforcement is the key. Countries can be very good in any other criteria, but if the enforcement is not happening, uh, they will uh, suffer criticism from the group and they will suffer from recommendations issued by the group. Uh, let us all hope let, that the text of the review recommendation, which we, we are planning to issue in December this year, will bring us to the next level, not only in of enforcing, uh, let's say, the, and the U.S. identity barrier cooperation through to traditional law enforcement activities, but also through, as we call them now, non-trial resolutions, which means through negotiated settlements, where we already see a higher level of cooperation between different countries. And I think this is the, the model we have to follow. If we will be able to achieve even greater level of cooperation between countries, uh, and we do this through the law enforcement meetings officials, law enforcement officials meetings at the OECD. We do, do this through regional law enforcement networks. Then of course, this world will not be such a safe place for the corruption perpetrators. 
and this world will become a bit better place for the companies trying to do their business in an honest manner. So let us stop here. Thank you very much once again. And I hope to see you next time at similar event, but uh, let's say in in-person uh, variant. Thank you and goodbye. Thank you. Thank you.